In today's video, we are going to go over the full life of Rhaenys Targaryen's father, Aemon Targaryen, the first rider of Caraxes. In 55 AC, King Jaehaerys and the people of Westeros were thrilled to learn that Queen Alysanne was once again with child. Princess Daenerys shared their delight, though she told her mother in firm terms that she wanted a little sister. You sound a queen already, laying down the law, her mother told her, laughing. The loss of Prince Aegon after only three days of life still weighed heavily upon her grace. Rather than subject herself to the rigors of travel or the demands of life at court, the queen sought the quiet of the ancient seat of her house, where her duties would be few. That is why Queen Alysanne chose to leave King's Landing for Dragonstone, there to await the birth of her child. The child came precisely when the maesters had said he would. A boy, clean-limbed and healthy, with eyes as pale as lilac. His hair, when it came in, was pale as well shining like white gold, a color rare even in Valyria of old. Jaehaerys named him Aemon. Daenerys will be cross with me, Alessandre said as she put the princeling to her breast. She was most insistent on wanting a sister. Jaehaerys laughed at that and said, next time. That night, at Alessandre's suggestion, he placed a dragon's egg in the prince's cradle. Thrilled by the news of Prince Aemon's birth, Thousands of small folk lined the streets outside the Red Keep when Jaehaerys and Alysanne returned to King's Landing a moon's turn later in hopes of getting a glimpse of the new heir to the Iron Throne. Hearing their chants and cheers, the king finally mounted the ramparts of the castle's main gate and raised the boy over his head for all to see. Then, it was said, a roar went up so loud that it could be heard across the narrow sea. Prince Aemon was a very serious boy, cautious, careful, and obedient. Though he could not as yet read, he loved being read too, and Queen Alasan, laughing, was oft heard to say that his first word had been, Why? In 57 AC, Jaehaerys and his queen found cause to rejoice again when the gods blessed them with another son, Balon he was named. Only two days before his birth, the white ravens had flown from the citadel to announce the arrival of spring, so Balaam was immediately dubbed the Spring Prince. As the children grew, Grand Maester Benefer watched them closely. The wounds, left by the enmity between the Conqueror's sons, Aenys and Magor, were still fresh in the minds of many older lords, and Benefer worried lest these two boys likewise turn on one another to bathe the realm in blood. He need not have been concerned. Save mayhaps for twins, no brothers could ever have been closer than the sons of Jaehaerys Targaryen. As soon as he grew old enough to walk, Balon followed his brother, Aemon, everywhere and tried his best to imitate him in everything he did. When Aemon was given his first wooden sword to begin his training in arms, Balon was judged to be too young to join him, but that did not stop him. He made his own sword from a stick and rushed into the yard anyway to begin whacking at his brother, reducing their master at arms to helpless laughter. The young princes loved their sister to distraction, it was plain to see, and Daenerys delighted in the boys, especially in telling them what to do. Grandmaster Benefer noted something else, however. Jaehaerys loved all three children fiercely, but from the moment Aemon was born, the king began to speak of him as his heir, to Queen Alysanne's displeasure. Daenerys is older, she would remind his grace. She is first in line. She should be queen. The king would never disagree except to say, she shall be queen, when she and Aemon marry. They will rule together just as we have. But Benefer could see that the king's words did not entirely please the queen as he noted in his letters. In 62 AC, the Lords of the Seven Kingdoms rejoiced when King Jaehaerys conferred upon his eldest the title Prince of Dragonstone, making him the acknowledged heir to the Iron Throne. Prince Aemon was seven years of age, a boy as tall and handsome as he was modest. He still trained every morning in the yard with Prince Balon. The two brothers were fast friends and evenly matched. Aemon was taller and stronger, Balon quicker and fiercer. Their contests were so spirited that they oft drew crowds of onlookers, serving men and washerwomen, household knights and squires, maesters and septons and stable boys. They would gather in the yard to cheer on one prince or the other. One of those who came to watch was Jocelyn Baratheon, the late Queen Alyssa's dark-haired daughter who grew taller and more beautiful with every passing day. At the feast that followed Aemon's investiture as Prince of Dragonstone, the queen sat Lady Jocelyn next to him and the two young people were observed, talking and laughing together through the evening, to the exclusion of all others. Six years later, the king and queen announced the betrothal of their firstborn son Aemon, Prince of Dragonstone, to Jocelyn Baratheon of Storm's End. Two years later, in 70 AC, 
Eamon and Jocelyn were joined in a ceremony that rivaled the golden wedding for its splendor. Lady Jocelyn, at 16 years old, was one of the great beauties of the realm. A long-legged, full-breasted maid with thick straight hair that fell to her waist, black as a raven's wing. Prince Eamon was one year younger at 15, but all agreed that they made a handsome couple. An inch shy of six feet tall, Jocelyn would have towered over most of the lords of Westeros, but the Prince of Dragonstone had three inches on her. There stands the future of the realm, Sir Giles Morgan said when he beheld the two of them side by side, the Dark Lady and the Pale Prince. In 72 AC, a tourney was held at Duskendale in honor of young Lord Darkland's wedding to a daughter of Theomore Manderley. Both of the young princes attended together with their sister Alyssa and competed in the squire's melee. Prince Aemon emerged victorious in part by dint of hammering his brother into submission. Later, he distinguished himself in the lists as well and was awarded his knight's spurs in recognition of his skills. He was 17 years of age. With knighthood now achieved, the prince wasted no time becoming a dragon rider as well, ascending into the sky for the first time not long after his return to King's Landing. His mount was the blood-red Caraxes, fiercest of all the young dragons in the dragon pit. The dragon keepers, who knew the denizens of the pit better than anyone, called him the Bloodworm. In 74 AC, King Jaehaerys and Queen Alassane were blessed again by the gods when Prince Aemon's wife, the Lady Jocelyn, presented them with their first grandchild. Princess Rhaenys was born on the seventh day of the seventh moon of the year, which the Septons judged to be highly auspicious. Large and fierce, she had the black hair of her Baratheon mother and the pale violet eyes of her Targaryen father. As the firstborn child of the Prince of Dragonstone, many hailed her as the next in line to the Iron Throne after her father. When Queen Alassane held her in her arms for the first time, she was heard to call the little girl our queen-to-be. Prince Aemon reached his 26th name day in 81 AC and improved himself more than able in both war and peace. As the heir apparent to the Iron Throne, it was felt desirable that he take a greater role in the governance of the realm as a member of the King's Council. Accordingly, King Jaehaerys named the prince his justiciar and master of laws in place of Roger Garin. The 83rd year after Aegon's conquest is remembered as the year of the Fourth Dornish War, better known amongst the small folk as Prince Morian's Madness or the War of the Hundred Candles. King Jaehaerys and his sons Aemon and Balon were dragon riders. Vermithor, Caraxes, and Vagar fell on Morian's fleet as it beat its way across the Sea of Dorne. Shouts rang out, and the Dornish filled the air with scorpion bolts, but firing at a dragon is one thing, and killing it quite another. A few bolts glanced off the scales of the dragons, and one punched through Vagar's wing, but none of them found any vulnerable spots as the dragon swooped and banked and loosed great blasts of fire. One by one, the ships went up in gouts of flame. They were still burning when the sun went down, like a hundred candles floating on the sea. That is why the Fourth Dornish War is also known as the War of the Hundred Candles. The Fourth Dornish War was fought and won in a single day. Back in King's Landing, King Jaehaerys and his sons received a riotous welcome. Even Aegon the Conqueror had never won a war without losing a man. In 92 AC, a Mirror's faction landed on Tarth and took the Evenstar by surprise. In a short time, they had taken the entire eastern side of the island. By that time, the Mirish were little more than pirates themselves, a ragged band of rogues. Neither the king nor his council felt it would require much to drive them back into the sea. Prince Aemon would lead the assault, it was decided. The Mirmen did have some strength at sea, so the Sea Snake would be first to bring the Valarian fleet south to protect Lord Boromund as he crossed the Tarth with the Stormlanders to join with the Evenstar's own levies. Their combined strength would be more than sufficient to retake all of Tarth from the Mirish pirates, and if there proved to be unexpected difficulties, Prince Aemon would have Caraxes. He does love to burn, the prince said. Lord Corlys and his fleet set sail from Driftmark on the ninth day of the third moon of 92 AC. Prince Aemon followed a few hours later after bidding farewell to Lady Jocelyn and their daughter Rhaenys. The princess had just learned that she was expecting, else she would have accompanied her sire on melees. Into battle, the prince said? As if I would ever have permitted that. You have your own battle to fight. Lord Corlys will want a son, I am sure, and I would like a grandson. Those were the last words he would ever speak to his daughter. Caraxes swiftly outdistanced the sea snake in his fleet, 
dropping down out of the sky on Tarth. Lord Cameron, the even star of Tarth, had fallen back into the spine of mountains that ran down the center of the island and established a camp in a hidden valley from which he could look down on the mirror's movements below. Prince Aemon met him there and the two made plans together whilst Caraxes devoured half a dozen goats. But the even star's camp was not as hidden as he had hoped and the smoke from the dragon's fires drew the eyes of a pair of mirror scouts who were creeping through the heights unawares. One of them recognized the Evenstar as he strode through camp at dusk talking with Prince Aemon. The men of Mir were indifferent sailors and feeble soldiers. Their weapons of choice were dirk, dagger, and crossbow, preferably poisoned. One of the Mir scouts wound his crossbow behind the rocks where he was hidden. Rising, he took aim on the Evenstar a hundred yards below and loosed his bolt. Dusk and distance made his aim less certain and the bolt missed Lord Cameron and struck Prince Aemon, standing at his side. The iron bolt punched through the prince's throat and out the back of his neck. The prince of Dragonstone fell to his knees and grasped the crossbow bolt as if to pull it from his throat, but his strength was gone. Aemon Targaryen died, struggling to speak, drowned in his own blood. He was 37 years old. How can my words tell of the grief that swept the Seven Kingdoms then? of the pain felt by King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysan, of Lady Jocelyn's empty bed and bitter tears, and the way Prince Rhaenys wept to know her father would never hold the child she was carrying. Far easier to speak of Prince Balon's wrath and how he came down on Tarth on Vagar, howling for vengeance. The Mirror's ships burned, as Prince Morian's ships had burned nine years earlier, and when the Evenstar and Lord Borman descended on them from the mountains, they had nowhere to fly. They were cut down by the thousands and left to rot along the beaches, so every wave that washed ashore for days was tinged with pink. Balon the Brave played his part in the slaughter with Dark Sister in his hand. When he returned to King's Landing with his brother's corpse, the small folk lined the streets screaming his name and hailing him as a hero. But it is said that when he saw his mother again, he fell into her arms and wept. I slew a thousand of them, he said, but it will not bring him back. And the queen stroked his hair and said, I know, I know.